we saw some of the things you were talking about in there, the sculpture that looks like it came from all kinds of Eastern religions. Also, the masks that have to do with your puppetry. Yeah. And you have some photographs with us today. The angels. Let's see the angels. We had John's angel yep. earlier. Well, maybe this was inspired by John somehow. <laughs> You see that? This is a new angel. This is uh, Julian Latrobe. He's a wonderful painter, and I did his portrait uh, as an angel. See, he has a palette and brushes. It's wonderful. That's a new one. Um, these are just three crazy people listening to the sound of angels. But the tableau, there's a tableau involved. How, how do you get your inspiration to build something like that? Oh, through my dreams and prayers. Do you? I have a telephone to, uh, line direct to God, and he calls me and tells me what to do. Does he also tell you where to get your um, models? They come to me magically. Do they? Yeah, it's it's a how can you find people to do these things? Um, this one I know is You know lovely Sarah Richardson. Wonderful, yes. She, this is very much like she is, but I've kind of made her into a goddess. I'm really into goddesses these days. Um, I know you love women. I do. I think you've been influenced all your life by women. Absolutely, yeah. This, this may be the cover to my new book, which is coming out um, in August uh, by Twelve Trees Press, and it's going to be called Theophanies. Uh, and this man is thinking. <laughs> Here's more clowns. I, I love clowns and masks. Tell us where you shoot these. I shoot everything at my studio. Uh, my camera's never seen the light of day. And, and usually at what time? When do you late start? Late at night. Only at night. Never in the morning. Is that when the angels come out? <laughs> oh, look who's this. The sliver. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to surprise me with this. I love this portrait of you, Joan. It's a triple exposure, and Joan's wearing a lot of her fabulous jewels. And crosses. You and were crosses. very adamant about making sure all the crosses came. I love that one of you. Let's see, what else have we got? This is uh, the performance artist, Rachel Rosenthal, flying through space. And she's a very powerful woman. That's beautiful. And uh, this is uh, the actress, Linda Carriage, as Marilyn Monroe. It's not Madonna. This is a little bit different. This is, um, this is I would my say, first book. departure from what you're doing. What, you weren't into goddesses the way you were? I'm this? getting more and more <laughs> metaphysical, I think in my newer work. This, this picture is from my very first book. How many books? To, uh, to Venice with my group, I took them to see the uh, Guggenheim, Peggy Guggenheim collection. And it was so interesting because I had met Peggy Guggenstein in New York at a certain time. And um, so when I went to see her, we renewed our acquaintance. And she was so happy that I led her, my group <laughs> through her uh, foundation, her uh, museum and home. Well, after we had gone there, we went through her gates to get out. <laughs> yes. And she came up to me and went through the gates that were existing. And she said, now, Claire, be very careful when you go through these gates because they're wood with iron insets. And one of them did fall out. Mm. And if they hit you, they'll kill you. Oh, wow. And so I said, well, my. And she said, would you make me some new gates? And that's how I got the invitation. And, and these gates, we have a picture of them. T tell us just what they're made of. Well, I would have liked to have made them of copper. But Italy, I don't know why, they think copper isn't strong and they've got to use iron. <laughs> so they're made of iron rod about oh, three, uh, three eighths or th two eighths, not quite a quarter of an inch. And I have a vocabulary that I have uh, 
developed throughout my life. It's been taken, it's taken all my life to develop a vocabulary. And one part of my vocabulary is the never-ending screen. Oh, yes. I forgot about now, that. Now, I... I remember sitting for this, and sitting is a very disciplined uh, it's hard situation. Work. It's very hard. But drawing is even more disciplined. How do you discipline yourself and keep that, that discipline at a high? It's, it's all uh, concentration. That, to me, is the most uh, important element uh, of, of my work. And um, I have uh, uh, an ability to, to, to concentrate under all kinds of really difficult circumstances. So just... And, of course, always working from life and working uh, with a lot of people who've never sat for an artist before, I have to be prepared for an awful lot of restlessness. How do you deal with that? I mean, um, let me tell you. I just work more quickly. Do you? Because I sat, I think, for three hours. I, I you were very good. That, that was a very slow period. That, that's when I was devoting the whole of a sitting to, to, to one picture. And uh, uh, yes, that certainly took uh, uh, more than two hours, probably around two and a half. And, and I know that you were like, I don't think I could have swerved your mind. I couldn't have done anything to stop you. You were like so intense and like having yes. this affair with the paper. Living <laughs> there? I always drew uh, um, uh, as a child. Um, it didn't really uh, uh, occur to me to make a career out of it. I think partly because uh, um, my parents never uh, encouraged me to, to be an artist. And in fact, my father actively uh, did what he could to discourage me from Is that right? Mm -hmm. Then how, how did you get to art school? Uh, uh, Chris, uh, uh, um, uh, he was the one who uh, not only uh, supported me in, in art school, but uh, gave me uh, the, the emotional support. Oh, I didn't realize that. So, oh, absolutely, So Christopher yeah. Isherwood was um, a big influence in your career. Oh, uh, he's... he's, he's uh, 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 singly responsible for, for my being an artist. Well, I remember when we talked about uh, Christopher Isherwood and whom you've been associated with and, and lived with for... 33 years. 33, for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one time, maybe in the 80s, you said, I am the Christopher Isherwood portraitist. And I thought, what a great job! Uh, uh, official portraitist. <laughs> oh, <yes>. official. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, yes, he, he he actually had portraits done by other people, but uh, oh, he did. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, of course, David Hockney. Yes. Yes, and uh, uh, William Coldstream in 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 England, and uh, uh, oh, lots of other people. But he did have have that belief in you. From the very yes, beginning. Yes, well, you see, I, I, I was still uh, uh, drawing as I had in my childhood when, when I met him, and he saw that I had a, a, an ability and said, why don't you try art school? It hadn't really uh, uh, occurred to me, uh, as I said, because my parents hadn't encouraged me. What were you drawing at the time? Always people. Always. Never anything but people. Because I've never seen you, I've never seen anything else. I wondered if you ever drew anything else. No, even when uh, um, I was a kid, uh, um, uh, always uh, um, uh, people, either from my imagination or from uh, uh, photographs. And it wasn't, uh, actually Chris was my first uh, live model, the first time I worked from live. And then um, uh, I went to art school, and then that was all uh, working from live models. And that was the real turn on. That's what made me uh, realize that uh, that's what I wanted to do. Can portraiture change over the years, your techniques? Oh, yes, yes. My technique has, has changed uh, uh, considerably. Well, for years, I only did uh, black and white drawings. Uh -huh. Color was a relatively uh, black late and white, development for me. Like like what, just pencil? Uh, uh, pencil, ink wash, finally pen and ink, uh, uh, all ink drawings. And then uh, from that I gradually went into uh, color, first doing wash paintings, uh, acrylic washes. And then uh, 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 gradually uh, uh, going to canvas. And, and also talk about the line as you start, like this, um, 
drawing of me. I don't know what, what year uh, this uh, was done. Pencil and ink wash, that was 77. In 1977. Yeah. So you were still doing the black and white. You hadn't gotten into color. Oh, correctly. yes, I, I'd begun uh, 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 the color by then. Uh, uh, I was actually uh, painting in, in, in the mid-60s. I didn't show the color work until 74. Oh, that's why. Yes. I mean, I just wasn't aware of it. Is that mm -hmm. what artists do a lot of times? They keep things in the background and wait till Yes, yes, some of them do. Uh, I can't, uh, yes, I, I, I was uncertain about the color work for a long time. And then it was Nick Wilder who said, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, let's, let's show some, some, some of these uh, paintings. The first time I showed him, I was fully prepared for him to say, well, I don't think they're ready yet, or I like this. Do you get a chance to do any a painting? Because I know you love to paint so much. I try and draw before I go out to work, you know, <laughs> to the store in the morning, and try and think up things. But the actual watercolors I do just in London when I'm hidden away. But at the moment, I've been doing some black and white fantasy drawings for all of Marshall Fields in Chicago, and they're like five foot high and covered with jewels. Really? Do you um, think they'll use them in the windows? They're going to use them <laughs> in the windows, and then they're going to use them around the base of the biggest interior tree as a Zandra Rhodes Christmas. And I'm turning the lights on in November. Oh, that's great. The other thing, um, when, when you have any kind of spare time at all, what do you like to do? I suppose draw and be with my friends because you always get rapport and it's only your friends that are, that they, they don't say just what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. They might say, you know, why aren't you doing such and such anymore? Or, you know, like, you encourage me all that time to get my book finished and set up exhibitions. And it's things like that that are so important. Someone will say, I haven't seen you do this lately. Why haven't you? And you go, oh, I've had so much to do. I haven't got around to that. But maybe I will now. Do you find um, that you're influenced by anywhere you go, if you're out to dinner, if you're walking on the street, or do you have to just think of a certain place no. that you're going to be influenced? I come to a place and do drawings, but sometimes the drawings might not necessarily achieve a collection. That doesn't oh. have to matter. I mean, like when I go to Japan, I get given so many flowers that I draw flowers. Now, sometimes it might end up that I do a theme of floral silk scarves, mm -hmm. but they get stored in my memory bank mm -hmm. and uh, get used somehow. Do you have any um advice for the people who are watching who can't buy a complete Zandra Rhodes or maybe they can buy a scarf because you have scarves or some small thing but something that gives them a feeling of what you like. I think with all the exciting people that you know it's not really that they're always wearing the right thing they've got their own combinations you've got all your own watches I've got maybe a big jewel. I've got my hair, which is this time it's bright ginger. Yes, it's and different. And those are all the different things that you offset things with. And I think in the period we're going to through, I don't think people should always spend money just for the sake of saying I've got to have a new dress when a scarf could be tied around or you could add it with a different combination or a different way of looking at it. Do you have certain colors that you think would um, help a person who has say an old dress in the closet and they keep wearing it all the time and they don't they feel uncomfortable. They I think sometimes new. you need to put a contrast color against it like if you've got a tie white dress that starts to go a bit yellow you could add red or black to it and give it an incredible black and white look black and white jewelry you know you could do all sorts of different experiments I mean I think that's what's exciting about dressing I, I know you you do a lot of, you don't set up things too much but you set up a portrait uh, of me Yes. And how did you decide where to put me? Okay, it's interesting. Um, I kind of do improvised environmental portraiture. It's, it's a little different. It's just I, I get very intense. And I kind of, even though I'd never met you before, right. uh, I, I have intuitive, psychic, 
I don't intuitions about people, but I also had maybe I looked at some of your videos and and I, there was something about Armenia, and then you were wearing a, a, a cross, cross. Right. and so I said, well, she must be involved in that in some interesting way, and so uh, I just and it was kind of accidental act out. We did it outside the gallery. But there's and there's outside some, the Rose Gallery in the Bergamot station, station. Yeah, there was an iron uh, ladder against a wall, and it kind of made a pattern that looked like a 35 millimeter film strip. Oh, it did. That's right. And there's a very famous photograph by George Platt Lines of Jean Cocteau looking at the camera, and he has his hand behind a ladder that looks like a 35 millimeter film strip because he made films. So somehow I thought you were that same kind of conversational <laughs> That's so person. great. I love that. And because it was interesting when I came you know, in, you went, OK, let's go over there. No, I have I it already. Just, I'm, I amazed And you myself. did. You went boom, boom, yeah. boom. OK, it's I, over. I don't know why. <laughs> why I'm, I don't know why I'm not like rich but, like Aine Leibowitz. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we do have to go. But I just wanted oh, to say one okay. thing is you did go to film school, and I found some of your work so Fellini-like and so yeah. Visconti-oriented and influenced. And I think that's what you yeah. said did happen to you. Well, the Fellini, you know, it's called magic realism, where the surrealism and fantasy grows out of just the everyday and ordinary. And you found it. And I found it. Thank you so much. All right. And interview in Rolling Stone uh, of my generation here in Los Angeles. Herb Ritz was one. Uh, Greg Gorman, another. Uh, uh, Paul Jasmine. Paul Jasmine, uh, who was an illustrator that became a photographer, and uh, Farooz Zahedi. These are all friends of mine. And we all began sort of at the same time and eventually figured out that we needed to have people help us do the styling and eventually drafted our friends or kind of, in, I think we may have invented the category of uh, celebrity stylist without knowing it. Uh, let's talk about those, those photographers, Bruce Weber, uh, Bob King, was it Bob? Bill King. Bill King, Bill King. Were you all in competition or were you all friends? Because you were working for, I mean, you were trying to get shoots at the same publications, I would imagine. Well, I guess we were competitors, but remember Bill King and uh, Bruce Weber were, were on the East Coast. They were right, New Yorkers. So right. I don't but think they did covers, too. Yeah, I don't think I, I, I don't, I got to know Bruce over the years. I never met Bill. Uh, but I, I think uh, that if there was a sense of competition, it was really uh, who was going to get to the editor and suggest a story first <laughs> and say, I got dibs. I got, uh, I got dibs way, on that right. one. But I, you were all friendly. It was a friendly group. Absolutely. Somewhat like still, the artists, right? I'm still friendly with those, with those with the photographers, yeah. very yeah. much so. Because um, well, I know... Herb Ritz is no longer living, I but know. Herb was a great friend. But during that time, the artists in Venice were all very friendly, too. Mm -hmm. And there was no competition between them. They would talk about sculpture and painting and whatever. I always felt that each of us had our own approach, and it really wasn't competitive. That's an interesting part, because I was going to ask you how you make a, pa a photograph your own. Oh, that's just a question of personality, isn't it, and one's interests. But uh, I think it's interesting to note that things were sort of ad hoc. And I could call the magazine and say, I just went to a show and saw this person perform. Or I just heard about this thing. And we should do something on it. If you do, I'd like to do that. Oh, that so way. we were almost contributing to the editorial content, not just taking the pictures. Yeah, I see, I see. So we were talking about um, being in the studio or being on location. I have a great picture that I'm going to show you right now that was on location. And it was for an interview shoot. And it was the Quinn Twins. Was that in your living room? No, that was at uh, Lloyd Ziff's. At Lloyd Ziff's house? Yeah. Remember <laughs> that? And I you don't did these it. great pictures on the inside of Interview. I think they were called Inner Girls or Inner, what was it called? Inner People? I can't remember. Anyway, so you did this great shot, and those are the Quinn twins, well, all made up. By Richard Shura. Right. Who was one of the greatest makeup artists of all time. Yeah, so that's, that's a little surprise photo for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we talked about all the photographers that you knew, and we talked about um, the support that you actually gave each other. 
Now, the, what about the covers of the magazines? You had um, Aguilara and Depp and Angelina Jolie, who went to Beverly How do you describe your work, then? How would you describe it? Uh, boy, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I could describe it. Uh, it's it, because it comes about through this this uh, contradictions it's situation. Not really, it's it's not really abstract then in your mind, right? It is abstract. More, it is not. Well, abstract. I've been torn between is painting as a physical fact on in this two dimensional situation right. called a plane, and that ar the artists call it a plane anyway, and one where the ca the canvas is a pictorial place. It's, it's a picture of right. something else. So one where it's a hard physical thing and the other one where it's, where it's a picture plane. And the collision of these two things has always intrigued me all of my life. So that's really not abstract. In a way, mm -hmm. it's like you're, you're giving us um, uh, concrete things. Well, it's, it's concrete and it's pictorial. And the two yeah. things sort of rack back and forth, and it's that I can't ally myself with one being the one. I see. Because they exist. I see. Along so, with several others. So we have to look for that. The next time we see your paintings, we have to look for this collision, and we have to know that it's Ed Moses, and what's, what's working in your yeah. mind. Well, so. no, I, I would say <laughs> absolutely wrong. Wrong, okay. <laughs> wrong. I'm wrong and we have to leave. No, but everybody <laughs> has that view. And the thing is, it's just there. Okay. So what are you going to do when you see it? We're going to... So you don't have to figure out anything. People get very intimidated oh, by painting. They think that it means something. I see. De Kooning said that what he really liked is that he was going to do something that was a kind of activity every day, and it didn't mean anything. I see. So we're, we're, that's what we're doing today. What we're doing today doesn't mean anything. Well, I want to thank it, you for being with us, because we have to go. It's virtual entertainment. <laughs> he entertained us today. My name is Ed Moses, and I'm a painter. I'm a painter by nature, and for a long time. I love line, the clarity of line, going left or right or right or left, or up or down or on a diagonal. I don't think anything goes through the mind. I think it's one thing leads to another. Do you think it's just all technical work? No, I think it's responsive. One that responds, one act responds to another act. I like the painting back there that says uh, Tiger's Revenge by Claude Balls. There's no passion and there's no emotion. People have that idea. It's not true. What drives it then? Personal madness. Till death do me part. Reasonably attractive. Um, <coughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, <coughs> I tend to paint. Uh, I tend to paint the space around me. Um, the visible world uh, felt, as it were. So uh, I live in the Hollywood Hills, so I paint the hills. Uh, the little house of the beach, so I painted the sea and the mountains lately. Um, in doing this, of course, I explore uh, the process of doing it as well. And uh, enjoy myself doing it.
on the work. The work looks kind of whimsical and cartoonish, but there's a really sensitive, um, uh, I don't know, inside to it, mm -hmm. especially since 9-11. I think you, you say that your art has changed a lot yeah. from that. It has, and it's the, my art for me, it starts out for me as, as a healing process. And I, I don't know what the healing process is I need personally for my soul, but that's, that's channeled you know, through a higher source through me and it goes onto the board. I get that advantage at that point. And then from there it goes out to people, friends, clients, whoever, the world. And that's, and, and since 9-11, I really felt, that's when the teddy birds really started to come about. And these, these are teddy birds. Yeah, these are teddy birds. They're part um, teddy bear and part bird. But you know, it, and I'm saying cartoon art in mm -hmm. like the greatest uh, of praise of your work and it is trendy now I think it's been a long time yeah. people who were doing this kind of cartoonish type of work d didn't get recognized the yeah. way they should well but they're fun and they're it's developing characters they're, they're, they're fantastic there's your background of the city yeah the, the city I some of them are just portraits like this is just a standard you know the portrait of the teddy bird and it's kind of a he's called a teddy bird so yeah, tell this us is teddy why bird. this is this is the pink teddy bird he's not a pink monster no he's not a pink monster what the, were the pink monsters the pink monsters were they i did those for about two years and they were um it was ironic they were monsters they were pink they were happy they made you feel good they they hung out in these little environments where there were flowers and volcanoes and landscapes and um the teddy birds have been in some of the pink monster paintings. Oh, they got it. Yeah, they, and they all kind of end up in their own, in a little world together. Were you always painting in in this genre, or did it become trendy for you? No, I've always painted this. You've always yeah, painted yeah, this one. Yeah, really. Uh, What's the the difference between the older paintings, the the large head paintings, is they were I would use my whole body and my arm to paint with. And they were large paintings and large brushes and oils, and with with downsizing to the boards and doing the small teddy birds, I use fine little um, paint brushes with just a few hairs and I'll oh. sit for hours meticulously working on these paintings. Do you use like a magnifying glass? No, I, I probably should, but I don't. What do you, what kind of um, material do you use? These are acrylic. And I work best with acrylic on the masonite. It's, a, it's a very thin... Yeah, these are just um, manufactured boards that um, frame. You keep them. talking about boards, but that's the frame, the yeah. square, right? Right, the frame. So it's just a square frame. and. Look how glamorous you did me. <laughs> I couldn't believe this. You just and you do your drawing so fast. I do. I, I like because I like to capture things with really. this took me like seven hours. Which is pretty long for you. Oh, that's a that's a lifetime for yeah, me. Yeah, for you. Because I, I grew up in the time when fashion illustration was like a, a, an instant kind of drawing. Oh. Boucher, Eric, those things in oh, Vogue. Antonio. Antonio. Though, well Antonio got very, very, very developed, but before that, you know, Boucher would just do these wonderful... Two or three lines? Yeah, it was just great. And that's what I grew up on. When you, also during the 90s, you were teaching. So you taught in oh, some yeah. of the art schools. Were you teaching fashion illustration? Yeah, I always taught fashion illustration. Uh, but my edge was, I didn't want to teach them a style. I wanted to teach them to draw. Well, yeah, so what do you do? If you're teaching fashion illustration, do you tell them you put too many lines in, you don't do this? You, how do you develop their own style for that? I kind of let them develop their own style. What you have to realize is that everything in fashion is predicated on shape. The shape, new shape of the eye, the new shape of the eyebrow, new shape of hair, A-line skirts. Everything is predicated on shape. And so what I do is try to get the students to see the essential shape of things. And then arms? It, arms, for sure. Long? Arms <laughs> long, other? hands, you know, long and tapered. But everything was shape. And if you can just see the shape, then you can render it, do it in ink, pen and ink, wash, however you want to draw it. Which you've done. You've used on these pastels, mm -hmm. ink, oh, uh, yeah. charcoal, charcoal, on this pencil. Uh -huh. What is this? This is pencil. This pencil. is graphite. Yours, yours was a uh, compressed charcoal stick. Uh, but I've done brush, pen and ink, 
all kinds of things. From after Bullock's Wilshire closed, I keep thinking there's going to be a change and fashion's going to swing back to illustration. Oh, yeah. <laughs> from your <laughs> lips. <laughs> well, from my lips, first of all, before we even go away, I, I want to make sure that you should have a show. You should have oh, a yes. book have talking book. about my <laughs> lips. <laughs> Let's put that out there because the, the illustrations and piles of them you brought over for me oh. to show. Oh, See, oh. I have easily 10,000 drawings that I've done just for myself, like these. And then as far as the commercial work, I'm sure I've got 50,000 drawings. Well, one of the things I know, David Hockney loves to draw, and he's always drawing. Yeah. Just like you, when you sit down to eat, you're always drawing. <laughs> and right. they say that a per person has to draw all the time. Oh, yeah, you totally, totally have to draw every day. Uh, Vasari said it. Before we go, let's quickly uh, go through some of these pictures. Sure. Cheryl Crow. Yes. Tell Cheryl us a Crow. little bit about that. Uh, we uh, photographed her for, for Architectural Digest quite quite recently. Um, she was wonderful. I mean, we uh, uh, just had a had a great time, and of course, because of the music and everything, we had a, a lot in common and uh, very wonderful professional. Clint person. Eastwood. Uh, Clint Eastwood. That, of course, that was an amazing event. <laughs> that I mean, you just think, oh my God, Clint Eastwood. And the funny part of it is, he when he comes in the room, he comes in, and you have assistants and the all different people, and uh, he says, hello, I'm Clint Eastwood. <laughs> like you're <laughs> like, not going to know. Duh. <laughs> so people, hello, I'm Clint Eastwood. People are, oh, yes, yeah, so, so you are. Uh, it, was, it was so impressive, Clint Eastwood. Yeah. <laughs> and also, is he the one who gave you the time limit? Right. He, <laughs> I love that. He gives you the time. One of the things when you're shooting personalities, people are, we're in a hurry, we're in a hurry. Usually not the personalities, managers and whatnot. And... Uh, so Clint Eastwood will say, well, you have 15 minutes, and he gives you that 15 minutes. He doesn't look at his clock once, but at the end of 15 minutes, he, Just gets he goes away. And you, but you know that. You don't say, oh, well, how about another five oh, minutes yes. or something. You, you, okay, that's good. You know, let, let me do my thing. You realize the time limit. And uh, I, I thought that was extremely professional. Yeah, that was great. And the last one was when Andy Warhol came here to do the love boat. He did the love boat. I yeah. know. I was. We did a party over there and uh, saw him afterwards because I was still writing for interview then. That's right. Do you know? I have to say, uh, this whole art project which I've done over the years, uh, you were so helpful in and getting me started in that. I, I just had no idea, and you gave me this whole list of people, uh, Joe Good and uh, Billy, Al. Billy Al and uh, uh, Chuck Arnaldi and Ed Laddie Moses. Dill and Ed Moses <laughs> and I had no idea, you know, and you go oh, call these people and tell them that Joan said the call and I wound up photographing absolutely everybody. Richard Diebenkorn. Oh, I know. All, but those all were, of these people. Was, Sam Francis. It all meant of these so people. much to me. Yeah. And to know that a professional was doing it was... You can't ask for anything it, more. It, I mean, it was great, and I and I remember showing pictures to Billy Allen. I this was I really, I said uh, he said, oh, you should do, do more and more of this. And I said, well, you know, everybody takes pictures of artists. And he said, oh, not like these. He said, and I, and it just stuck with me. I mean, I've done yeah. it for thir thirty five years. Because exhibitions around the world. You see, I'm very keen, I think as an artist, we should all be traveling around the world because to me, the creative force is the one, is the force, really, is the savior of the world. Creativity. And uh, the more one can travel with the work and show the work, it's, I think it's very important. Is there a certain um, element that you haven't discovered yet? Is there something that you keep thinking you're going to find? Yes. Oh, yes. What I is mean, it? I don't know. <laughs> That's why I keep searching. I, you know, I, I'm using mirror, which has so many endless possibilities. At the moment, I'm doing portraiture. And in fact, I've got um, a piece at the moment in Madonna. I've just done a Madonna huge portrait of her. Out of what? Glass. So it's a flat mirror piece? Yes. Do in we fact, have... we, we do have a... I'm afraid the images are a bit small. But we do have something here. These, in let's fact, see, are mirrored here. Let's see. I'll hold here. them this yes. way over here. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. And let's see if we can just... 
come Can in on. See? They're very uh, small. Very small, very oh, difficult there, to see. There, that's good. Can you describe them? Yes. Now? Well, these here, this is my brother Richard and Peter, my sister Janet, mm -hmm. Michael and Robin. And they are... Little I, Nell. It's, yes, and Little Nell, but these are three-dimensional and divine. I see, and the other ones but are But the flat, flat ones, I actually cut rather like, I always describe it rather like a Matisse drawing, where you, go, you've, you can only do one line, you can go... Ch -ch -ch -ch. Oh, is that how they're done? And that's how they're hand? done, yes. Um, so are those displayed in the museum? Yes, some of them. But it's my new obsession, really, portraiture, because I think really without people there wouldn't be art. So, I mean, people to well, me then, are the most important. How do you pick the people for your portraiture? Well, I've started with family and friends, and I've had commissions now. Do you think it's because you know the person? No. Uh, you feel that you have to know the person? No, better? I don't actually, because as I've done some, I did Margaret Thatcher, which was an extraordinary picture. Um, it was bought and it was hanging opposite a mirror. And when you looked at it in one way, she looked wonderful and, you know, kindly person. And then you looked in the mirror and I'd made her eyes so blue and steely. There was this other side to her, you know, the Iron Maiden. And it's, so it has these aspects that you can see in the mirror. And you don't have to actually, you don't feel like you have to actually be there with them. No. You can interpret it. Yes. But um, have you thought about doing Hollywood? I'd love to do Hollywood. Anything in yes. Hollywood. Yes! I adore Hollywood. I think it's uh, the sunshine and the, there's just something about it. Well, that's what I was going to ask you before we leave the studio, because uh, I know you're, you're just visiting. You haven't been to Los Angeles for, for a few years. No, I was actually here last year. Was it last year? And you were away in um, Vienna. That's what happened. Oh, it was a year ago. So, and before but, that was three years. But the thing is, all, it seems like English people love to come to Los Angeles. Well, it's the sunshine. Is you that know, what Jen, it is? You have the sunshine. Well, that's what I wondered. If that was your favorite part, 